part of my job in this project is to ask the question why um, did people serve? Why did Aboriginal and Torres Strait, Torres Strait Islanders uh, enlist and go away and fight? And, you know, what it was like when they were there uh, and what happened when they came home. Uh, and you must remember they were time, those wars were fought over times when there were things like the Protection Acts in place and Aboriginal lives and Torres Strait Islander lives were very governed by government and welfare authorities and mission bosses. <laughs> Uh, and that control over their movement, over who they could marry, where they could work, total control. They went away thinking that if they came home, things would change. They wouldn't have these controls. No, they wouldn't have to have a pass to leave the, the mission or the government settlement or the reserve. Uh, they wouldn't be told where they could work. They didn't have to get permission to marry whoever they wanted to. Those sorts of things, they could, could keep custody and control of their kids. Um, but when they got back, many felt that, th well, many things didn't change. <laughs> um, and they went back to the settlement or the government station or the, the mission reserve, and it was the same old, same old. This project's tracking through 100 years from the Boer War right through to the um, Afghanistan War tracking Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander service during those times. But there's some, some um, evidence that Aboriginal trackers as were taken to South Africa as scouts and um, weren't brought back uh, under the White Australia policy. No, nobody I've spoken to in this project has said that they regretted serving. Um, they're all very proud to serve, and they still are, and their families share that pride. You know. They speak very glowingly about family members who've served. Um, servicemen tend to be, and women tend to be a little more modest about their, their service, but um, they're proud of it, you know. um, in spite of what and how they were treated of what happened when they came back and how they were treated in Civvy Street. I had one veteran say to me, you know, that when I asked the question about discrimination in the military, um, say, well, no, there was none because we quickly realised that um, the enemy bullet doesn't discriminate. So we'd look after each other. Colour didn't matter. We've heard a lot of stories, um, uh, and they sweep across all the emotions. They're sad, they're happy, they're in between. Um, and there's some, there's some great um, uh, stories of courage. Um, soldiers involved in crucial battles for, for the military. And, and displaying extraordinary um, heroism. Um, and there's, there's diaries and photographs and things like that. The, the diaries are fascinating reading. We had one guy who had a hundred year old diary in a plastic bag inside another plastic bag with a, a whole heap of photographs in plastic bags you know, of his great grandfather's service in the First World War. And, um, I was appalled. <laughs> oh God, there we look at. But we managed to photograph that he was he was going to part, and we didn't expect him to part with it. And we did say, you know, there's we can send, you can get put you onto somebody. He'll tell you how to look after this properly and um, look after these photographs properly. Um, and um, but we managed to record all of that stuff and and photograph the diary. You know, so we've got an electronic copy of it at least. Um, but you know, it's, it's like the biscuit tin archive and, or the shoebox archive, or in this case, the plastic bag archive. You know? um, people pull stuff out from all over the place and, it's, uh, and that's, a, that's a, um, a really rewarding part of the, you know, I find it a good, it gives me a buzz to be there and to people pulling out these treasures and they're they treat them as treasures and we'll certainly record them so we've got them electronically each anyway for the future.